Now, um, we ha we're going to have a, a short period for, for questions. We're going we're to shorten it down to 10 minutes. Any questions for the second half? But before that, Murray just wanted to mention something that he forgot earlier. Here. Yeah, in the back of the uh, graph that I gave you on the uh, projected cost of Medicare and Medicaid, there's an article from the Wall Street Journal from 1991. And I think I'm the only person in the country that's been quoting from it for the past 20 years by Peter Drucker. Usually, uh, the argument from authorities of great fallacy, but this case, it works. Uh, Drucker basically predicted the mess that we're in today in 1991, and he, c he concluded in the opening and in the conclusion of his article, government has proved incompetent at solving social problems. And you've heard today at this panel how the nonprofit sector can do that, and the title of his article is, It Profits Us to Strengthen Nonprofits. So 20 years ago, he foresaw the crisis in health care, and he was predicting that nonprofits are the solution to not only health care, alcoholism, um, illiteracy, just go down the list, and he's basically calling for the end of the welfare state. I mean, he makes Romney look like a communist. <laughs> I mean, that's what he's basically saying here, that the welfare state should be abolished lock, stock, and barrel. <laughs> and uh, I hope you read this because this will be on the final exam in the fall. So, we'll t <laughs> so take it to heart, please. Okay, we have a time for a few questions. I was, I'm John Eck. I'm the other Eck, <laughs> the lesser one. Um, one of the things that I was going to add to all of this is that, um, really, when you're talking about community, we're all really talking about the family and the family unit. The family's really, really important. Uh, let me explain a little bit about the economics of the family as it pertains to my house, for instance. You know, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, when they got eld old, older, they could not live by themselves. They had two options. They could go to an assisted living and pay $300,000 down payment, $2,500 a month, they could go to a nursing home, pay up to $10,000 a month to $20,000 a month, or they can come live with me. So, you know, you say, oh, well, yeah, I don't want to be involved in that. I couldn't live with my mother-in-law. She's awful. Well, you make, you know, you <laughs> make <laughs> adjustments, okay? I happen to love my mother-in-law, by the way. She's in heaven. And it goes on. <laughs> My father and mother also came to live with us. My father passed away in a car accident. I took care of my mother for the next 20 years. She just passed away. Now I went to my town and I said, um, I got some elderly folks and they don't want to spend $200,000, $300,000 on care for the elderly. By the way, we're all going there real quick. So what I'm saying, really important okay because you're there or you're dealing with that issue because many of us are in that sandwich generation yeah, we're taking care of elderly and our children and we're trying to figure out how to do this but what I'm trying to get to is very simple once you create that addition to your house that the town says oh yes we now will give you the permit for making that addition you now have an addition. And so I have an elderly woman in my practice. She's a widow. Her son died. She's by herself. She's literally shaking in fear. What is she going to do? Live with you. She is. Sorry. We drew letters up. We drew a letter up, and I said, this is the arrangement. Elizabeth, we're adopting you. <laughs> now, it so happens that Elizabeth has some means. She says, and I told her, I said, Elizabeth, guess what? You know what you're going to do? You're going to allow me to live in Franklin because they're going to tax the living daylights out of me. And you're going to allow me to live here so that I can take care of others at the clinic. Okay. So I'm living in, t in Franklin, net, tax-free. So what building community is all about. 
Yeah, you give up on privacy. Okay. I check in on her every morning. Hi, Elizabeth. How you doing? Did you sleep last night? And then that night, Elizabeth, you hungry? How you doing? And one night a week, she insists on cooking. She cooks. And Alita cooks. And then I order McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> What I'm trying to say is that community is the antidote as we all, and we're going to have to start thinking like the Asians, like uh, the Amish, like a lot of others. We were so independent. We could go to Florida and go to the, you know, chase golf balls. That's not life. That's not reality. You know, and it's so neat because I, I mean, I just, I can, Alita and I could spend days talking about story story after story about individuals just at the since we had hurricane irene we had no idea how to take care of these people with money with medicines i don't get federal grants they don't give it to us we don't get any grants we never ask for money we have close to three hundred thousand dollars worth of medicines donated and the weird thing about it is that some of the medicines come in of a nature that I don't predict. In other words, why did I just get all these inhalers and albuterol and proventil and, and next thing you know, I have the worst allergy season and I had the medicine. And then the next thing you know, you hear why do we get $50,000 worth of Nexium? And then next thing you know, I've got a rush of people coming in with same issues, ulcers, stress ulcers, and so forth. And then you'll see somebody drive up in the BMW. But by the way, poverty is weird. You're riding high, I don't need help. And the next thing you know, your Wall Street firm dumps you. You're on the street. And now you've got that expensive home in New Jersey that's now underwater, you can't make payments on, and you're going to be foreclosed, and you are scared to death, and you are now hungry, and you're embarrassed to tell your neighbor, and your brother, and your family where you are, and you sheepishly go to Zarephath Health Center, and you go to the food pantry. You want to see somebody die. See somebody in a BMW going to the food pantry and then sit next to some Mexican in the waiting room as they get their health care, and they, you tell them, by the way, do you need any medicine? How are you doing? Now that guy's going to bounce out of where he was. You know what they do? They come up to me, I don't even know them. Here's a $10,000 check, stick it in your hand. We're cash positive, and I've never had to ask for a dime. Right and so I'm just telling people that that is really what we have to do. And it's, you know, it's, it's maybe it's the old fashioned religion that we used to know about. It's, you know, care for widows, and orphans, and keep yourself from being corrupted. But anyhow, thank you. I just go thank you, around. John. Yeah. Question in the back, Jeremy. <laughs> Thank you. I, I had two questions concerning the um, uh, free clinic. Is one, do you truly do it as free? Do people pay any, any amount? I heard $15 getting thrown around there. Um, and then my second question is, could you do that in your, create some sub-corporation that you saw them in your clinic already so you have access to your facility, say x-ray or cast saws in my case as an orthopedic surgeon um, where you could do that within your own clinic and still be protected under the federal tort reform. The Federal Tort Claims Act requires that we do not charge the patients anything. They're allowed to put a donation in a box and then we get donations from other people who love our charity, but um, we're not allowed to charge them. We can't do sliding scale, anything like that. And at first I thought that, well, yeah, people should pay something, they'll value it more, you hear that, but you know something? If you charge them $15 and they pay $15, they're going to think they paid in full. 
And that's not really true. It, they need to know that this is a very valuable service that we are giving freely to you. That's why um, I've come to realize that it's a better way to do it where you don't charge anything. As far as the, um, right now the Federal Tort Claims Act is limited, that you have to provide the care within a venue, and so surgery really isn't covered by the Federal Tort Claims Act um, unless it's done at the, the clinic that is, that is deemed as a free clinic by the federal government, so it's limited. That's part of the reason why I wanted to see it expanded and let the state kind of take on the rest of the liability for surgeons and for obstetricians and I think of the thoracic surgeons. It was a real shortage in this area of thoracic surgeons and it's sad because people end up really waiting for that kind of surgery. But if that answers your question, it's not, we're not quite there yet where we can take care of uh, Elite, I want to add to liability that. for you. Uh, when it comes to the facilities for where you provide the care, it's my belief that you really need to work and as a partnership with your church. Uh, even though you're just a surgeon, that patient is going to have more medical needs, and I beg your pardon, I didn't mean it to come out that way. It, it, in other words, the surgery focuses very tightly versus looking at the holistic needs of the patient. And there's even more needs for that patient beyond direct medical care. They have a need for that community to, to, to feel safe and everything else. When it comes to providing specialty services such as yours within a region, there's no reason you docs can't all get together, open one 501c3 that's one of the outpatient surgery centers and all share it. And at the same time, have, have your local you know, community church entity. So there's, there's ways that you can get around all, all of this and do it. The biggest thing with the 501c3s I see as a problem is right now is the federally qualified health clinics who are out there as a 501c3, but they're taking government money. That does not solve the problem. Thank you. Dr. Crispin. I uh, just want to commend all of you for the charity clinics. I think it's a beautiful thing. Dr. Ligner, uh, when you, uh, in your charity clinic, do you only do ophthalmology? Uh, well, actually, I do, um, I do all kinds of medicine as an MD, not just a surgeon. I can do everything. I do draw the line at pelvic exams. <laughs> um, and so, so the answer is that I do everything, and then I have other doctors that come in who are willing to do that until I get the federal recognition, are willing to do that within their own malpractice coverage. If they bring their malpractice coverage to the clinic, then they can, of course, practice there in the context of the free clinic. And the answer to that previous question is, is that you don't want to have it in your clinic because that's not something that is separate. You'd have to designate within your office a specific area only suited to that free clinic and no other use for it, much like if you had a home office. A surgery center, unlike the other situations, you can designate certain procedures in the surgery center that would be qualified. And they don't want you doing heart surgery or big numbers, but Cataract surgery is a well-defined entity that it recognizes an easily deliverable charity. I'm sorry. So uh, just let me clarify, then is this the same location as your office? No, no, it's, it's not. not. Actually, it's not actually, actually, we've heard church, church. I looked around and I looked at church. I looked at, at um, uh, civilian type things. I looked at um, uh, the hospital alliance and I am uh, firmly aligned with the Moose Lodge. <laughs> And the Moose Lodge is, of course, a, uh, a national organization. And actually, if we talk about trying to go viral with this, the Moose International is keenly interested in having all their little Moose Lodges all around the country that are usually located deep in poor country in each of the communities get involved in something like this. That's Excellent. just the whiff I've gotten from the excitement Very that good. I've gotten. And oh, by the way, they have a lot of money, so I plan on asking them for some. So when you have surgery to do, do you do that in your office? Or I do in the take, hospital? no, I take that to my surgery center. I have a surgery center solely owned by me. I'm the only one who uses it. I am a wild, wild guy. I just do that. <laughs> you know, my response, was, I'm doing it anyway. So my response is that if you guys don't want me to do it in the surgery center, then I will do it in the clinic because I don't have any federal dollars, so I don't have to be Medicare certified. I don't have to do anything with that. I can just, all I need is a knife and a spoon and a light. So I can get a cataract out in your kitchen. So do you want me to do it in a kitchen, or do you want me to do it in a state-approved Medicare-certified facility? Just cover my ass when I'm there. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so do you charge for your facility? No, no charges. Nurses all, all donate. Is, I get the donated lenses or I eat it. I just, you know, if I'm doing 15 cases, adding one is a nothing. So this is just an addition to your regular practice that Correct. you just take to the surgery center. And I do debate because I also volunteer at the university of grabbing some of the patients and dragging them down to Newark and then having the residents do them with me. And, um, and that's something that for training purposes, because I train the re residents. But that, and that would be pure charity that way for them. And, and you see, this is such a beautiful thing because, uh, you know, it's the way charity really ought to be done. But if you take most of these people to the hospital, the nonprofit hospitals will charge them a huge amount, which they will collect, by the way, huge amounts from Medicaid. This is actually an interesting thing. Based on my conversations at the federal level, I have the ability to designate, and I was talking about this earlier with one of our legislative assistants, is that the doctors who provide charity, charity care in the emergency room, they come in, do that gallbladder in the middle of the night on a free patient, take that person to the surgery. They have all the liability because they're coming in as a private practitioner. If I put that person into my charity care, in my charity clinic, that's not mine, but if I put him into the charity clinic, the free clinic, then he goes to the hospital in the context that he's, he's providing that, that donated time and then that encounter in the emergency room and then when he takes that person to the hospital's operating room, I can designate that encounter, just like I said a moment ago about doing that procedure, that procedure will be a free care event in the middle of the night inside the hospital and it'll have the Federal Tort Claims Act liability coverage and that individual doctor will not have that coverage. That's huge. That is unbelievably wow. huge. You unburden the general surgeons, the vascular surgeons, the GI guys who are snaking stuff out of hidden spots. That's a big number. So now, one more question, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, it, it, what determines whether a person is eligible to your clinic? Uh, um, I just basically ask, what is, how much money do they make? And, I have a, and we're still debating about whether it's the 200% or the 300% of local poverty. And if they make above that, we encourage them to find their care elsewhere, but we will still see them, but we will still, and, and the ex have taught me that you can um, pretty much identify who the individuals are. And then um, the second question is, do you have insurance? And that really is just, you know, th if they say no, I'm not going to do a wall biopsy and check for a card. They're just gonna continue on through the system. Okay, so wall biopsy, that's a medical term. <laughs> <laughs> So, so these are people who aren't eligible for Medicaid then? Correct. And in fact, I approached the Medicaid clinic that is down the road and they were pretty snarly to me initially. And I said, hey, I'm just doing free people. They don't have any, they don't have any insurance at all. If they got Medicaid, they say, I got Medicaid, I'm going to say, go see you because that's a for-profit, for-profit Medicaid clinic. I don't want to see them. I don't want to see them. I'll see them. I don't care who they are. Let me say this, though. In our clinic, the Medicaid office is actually sending people to our do. free clinic yeah. and do because they, they can't find a doctor. And no. I believe they, present, they try to present no. their card, and you say, we don't take that. Yeah, I'll do it for free. I don't want your card. Yeah, I don't want your card. It, because in my state, Put that away. Uh, the hospitals, whenever they get a hold of these people, they want to sign them up for Medicaid right away. Right. So somebody 200 300% above poverty, they're going to be on Medicaid right, right off the bat. I've had the hospital call me up asked me to put my kids on Medicaid. Okay, this is how aggressive they are mm -hmm. in signing people up for Medicaid because they're making money on it. So it's hard to compete. Yeah, it's not charity care. They're making money they're on it. They're making money. Right. Yeah. Uh, Murray, you had something? Yeah, if physicians are interested in setting up a nonprofit health center in their communities, the website to go to is volunteersinmedicine.org, I believe. That's the umbrella organization for the uh, volunteers in Medicine started by Dr. Jack McConnell in Hilton Head back in the 90s. That was the first volunteer in medicine uh, health center in the country. And there, I think there are about 60 of them throughout the United States. There are several of them in New Jersey. I guess you're part of that. Actually, you know, no. I actually have, I have aligned with a national consulting service called Echo Clinic. Okay. And, and Echo Clinic it used to be a church-based organization, but it's no longer church-based. And if you go to their website, if you go to my website, free care, the clinics, Free, care, uh, free clinic newton.org and you go through that you'll find the echo link and they have 1500 free clinics across the United States and they provide a 187 page manual that you can get as a PDF share that with all your board of directors and it gives you basically the how to you know free clinic for idiot for dummies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. manual in other words the, the bottom line here is there is an infrastructure in place in the United States to replace Medicaid within the next five to ten years at no cost to the taxpayer. 
Wow. And this is the great hidden secret that's going on in medicine that many of the politicians do not want to know about it. I've spoken to several of them, and as Drucker points out, the bureaucrats and the politicians want credit because, as Bastiat observed 160 years ago, phony philanthropy is the calling card of the politician. It's not real philanthropy, which is using your own time and money to address a social problem in the community. We're looking at $10 billion just in the state of New Jersey alone. And, and before we wrap up, I'm going to give everybody in this room an action item. All right. Real action. You go home, you talk to 10 people. Five of them are going to be docs. You go around the doctor's offices, you, in some manner or another, go spread the idea. Get your doctor's email addresses. Go to the, these medical complexes, you know, where they've got all the little separate offices. Print a flyer, stick it under their windshield wipers. Contact at least 10 people. The people in this room, that's a thousand more. Tell them to contact 10. All right? Throw the rock in the pond and let the ripples spread. If you go home and stay silent, we have failed in our mission. Thank you. Thanks, Nora. <clears throat> okay. Um, so what do we do now? Well, for the doctors, what I recommend is sometimes it's kind of hold, hard to go cold turkey. But pick up one or two things that you can do on a cash basis. Prolotherapy, Botox, anti-aging medicine, uh, you know, LASIK surgery. There's a lot of really easy natural ones. Okay, take that on. Educate your patients. Educate your patients. They want education. They want you to talk to them. They trust you. They, they trust you way more than politicians or lawyers. Okay? They rely on you to tell them the truth and, and tell them that. Uh, there's some good sections in here. I talk about McCarran Ferguson on page 15. I talk about how the, the Obamacare's fascism, you know, versus Hillary Care being socialism on page 79. I talk about Captain John Smith uh, and, and that true insurance that I talked about, that's in chapter eight, adaptive health care. It's a nice little primer. It's pocket size. You can put it right inside your pocket. Uh, I've read it 87 times, so <laughs> uh, it's, it's an easy read. It's an easy read. Um, Educate yourself, learn more, talk to people, get out there. And I hope that, that this has been a productive day. Uh, as I said, Jeremy will be sending out an email next week. We'll talk a little bit you know, about what the speakers had to say, their books, their websites, uh, where you can get more information, where you can contact the speakers. And stay engaged, get, get you know, be more than, than the chicken, be the pig, okay? Put some skin in the game because it relies on it. Our profession relies on it. The app's logo, the, um, the slogan, Omnia Pro er ergat Ergato. What that means is all for the patient. Okay, that's Latin, all for the patient. That's what app stands for. And, and without the patient, there would be no practice of medicine. So I want, I, I'd like everybody to thank the speakers that came today on the first and second panel. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Drive safe. Have a great evening. And if you're in South Jersey.